were listening to episode 185 of Vital Life Radio. I'm Matt Blackburn, and today I'm interviewing John the Savage. That's probably the coolest introduction that I've ever done. I love his name. John's a personal trainer. He's been studying physical fitness for several years, and he shares a really simple approach. Several years ago, I was using a hex bar and deadlifting several times a week, and I gained a ton of muscle. And this was at a time when I was actually on a vegan diet and eating a lot of beans and soy and zero sugar. It was a really wild experiment that I was doing fasting for 23 hours a day, but I did gain a ton of muscle, mostly from just doing deadlifts. And I think for a lot of people, the aesthetics is really important. And for me, that's just a side benefit. It's not the main focus to look big or to look ripped because I think that body dysmorphia has pervaded the health community to where men should look like Hercules and women should all have low body fat. And I think that aspect of why you're doing it, just like anything else, really matters. And I think a lot of people get into strength training for the wrong reasons because they're trying to compensate for low self-esteem or whatever it is. And while gaining muscles can definitely help with that in a man, it can also turn them into a mean person, which I've seen a lot in the health community. People just get this holier than thou attitude because they have muscles and they strength train all the time. So it really comes back to why you're doing it. For me, I'm most interested in longevity. I know a lot of people don't care about that. They're more interested in performing and then dying at a ripe age of 100 or 120. And that's completely fine. It really depends on what your goals are. But either way, I think listening to what John has to say in the show can help you out, especially if you don't know where to start, if you're overwhelmed. I think there's so much information out there about fitness and strength training, just like supplements and nutrition. There's people on all sides trying to convince you of their different ways of doing things. And John's way is simple. It's a place to start. And you could build from there if you want into more complexity. So I'll stop ranting. Here is John the Savage. All right. We are here with John the Savage. Welcome to the show. All right, Matt. Thanks for having me. Long time listener, first time guest. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Yeah. We've been friends for, what, three, four years now. I lost count. Maybe three yeah, years so. Uh, been chatting back and forth with different protocols and stuff and and life and um we seem to have kind of a similar uh background with you know people that we've listened to uh i know you were inspired heavily by ray pete and took some of his ideas and integrated them and um it's different health educators and it's uh it seems like it's one big experiment and no one person has it all figured out that's my current perspective yeah absolutely and honestly that's like more than half the fun of it because you know i i hope i never come to the conclusion where like i have it all figured out because then you know like what's the fun in that like the journey really is the destination when it comes to this and experimenting and learning about yourself and learning about different things that you can apply to different people that's just all part of the process and really helps grow that base of knowledge that makes you a valuable person Mm -hmm. When did you start studying natural health and, and why did you get into it? So I started getting serious about it probably when I was like 23. I just finished up my bachelor's in college, which, you know, psychology did absolutely nothing with that. But, um, you know, it definitely got me thinking because obviously I had so much uh, background with the whole mind aspect that I started to consider the body and 
you know, up until then, the only thing I really considered with the body was training, but naturally the missing component in that little trifecta is nutrition. So, you know, funny enough, like the Sean Baker and like fasting rabbit hole was the first one that I went down. So I was like hella carnivore, just slamming meat and fat and fasting, and just, just basically for a good, like almost half year of my diet was just not eating. And when I did eat, it would be, you know, meat. Eventually that slowly transitioned into raw stuff and, you know, Ogenis for what he is, is definitely someone that will make you start to think and question a lot of stuff about the mainstream narratives for health. And I really like that about him just because he really changes your perspective on so many things. And frankly, coming from such like a basic like understanding of nutrition where I was taking stuff like D3 fish oil, just like basic multivitamin and thinking like, oh, you know, all my nutritional requirements are met because I took that. It just kind of like wiped the slate clean of that thought. And then slowly over the years until now, I've been rebuilding that into something that I feel is more geared towards what actual health is. And yeah, right now I'm just doing my own thing, doing just some raw, some cooked. It's just really kind of matters on the day and how I'm feeling. But yeah, I, I really try not to be super strict. And especially with my wife coming over and cooking for me as much as she does, it's kind of hard to be strict. But, you know, I'm happy that that sort of orthorexia is kind of like dissipated from my life and my thinking. And while it's still certainly present in other ways, I think as a whole, just having that weight lifted off my shoulders is putting me in a significantly better place, even if I would say that, you know, when I was 100% raw, I was like healthier. Like I may have been healthy physically, but mentally, you know, I was definitely missing some things. Yeah, I remember when I was 100% raw vegan and it was so tricky going out to eat for birthdays and events, I would have to go to my health food co-op and buy the packaged key, you know, well, I was hundred percent vegan. So I guess that was kind of on the same level as raw, as far as difficulty of maintaining it, mm. you know, cause every place we'd go to every cheese would be in stuff and dairy would be mixed in, but yeah, definitely screws with your social life. And I feel like just your, your mental health, right. To be uh, that strict. Yeah, absolutely. And the funny thing is, like, even before I was like, so committed to diet, like, you know, just because I was always pursuing fitness, like I was so used to telling people like, Oh, no, I can't go out. Like I'm cutting right now. Like, Oh, it doesn't fit my macros, blah, blah, blah. Like, I already had like, a incredibly long list of excuses to use with people. But now it's just like, yeah, like, let's go. Why not? You know, th that that social aspect definitely does something for the soul that I think a lot of people do not take into consideration when they talk about their own well-being. And like, yeah, the food might not be the best quality. It might be cooked and questionable oils and all that, but just being able to be out with friends and enjoy something, and, you know, enjoy a meal because there is such a social aspect to that that has been with us throughout almost like all human history. I think that's really important. Yeah. I've noticed like, french fry hate recently mostly coming from dave asprey like seems like once a month or so he'll like post like an anti fried food post i remember he said you know smoking cigarettes is better for you than eating french fries it's like wait a minute <laughs> <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> yeah i don't know i think french fries are delicious and i think we can mitigate you know i don't eat fried foods every week you know i'll, I'll cycle it or whatever but yeah um so w before we started recording we we're talking about copper and you said you've been experimenting yes. kind of want to jump into that for a little bit absolutely so based off of the interview you had with jason hommel like i just took the dive completely into copper and you know i used the copper sulfate to make my own solutions initially i was doing that topically and i was doing uh i think i have copper bisphenate that i was doing orally and honestly, like I was going fucking crazy with the uh, with doing it topically. I know you were saying you were doing like 
15 to 20 dropper falls. But dude, like I was literally like my forearms, my legs, like the backs of my legs, any spot that I could like feel that, that could get saturated. I was doing it maybe like every 30 minutes when I was at work. So I was like, just, abs- I-, I was literally turning blue because there was so much on me. And there was so much on me that like, you know, in the webbing of my hands and in the inside of my elbows, like it would eventually dry up and it would start like, you know, messing with my skin. So I eventually decided to just bite the bullet and try doing it orally because I tried it once. I think I only did like five drops too, which is crazy to look back on. But um, I did five drops just straight to the dome and that made me beyond nauseous. And I remember perusing his Facebook group and he said something about doing it with milk. Uh, uh, helping with the nausea so whenever I would have like you know a protein shake or like my post-workout shake or just coffee like I'll, I slowly worked up from five to now 12 drops and like I don't have any of the nausea and I really think I'm starting to experience like the benefits that he associates with like restoring copper which is just like insane energy when you were on the copper bisglycinate how many milligrams were you taking I think I started at 20 and I worked up to 40 milligrams. Wow. So I know that the ratio between like actual copper and glycine, you know, you're not getting so much, but yeah. you know, it's just something that I had around because um, the science file was going up out of business. And I just scooped it on a sale and I was like, yeah, you know, I'll try it out. And honestly, like, you know, it, it's still something I have around, but the sulfate is just so convenient because, you know, you just mix it up and then you have it for like, you know, for the better part of the month and it's just no hassle whatsoever. You don't have to weigh anything. It's just something you can just drop away and you're done. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things like making homemade magnesium bicarbonate that it's like pennies. It's so cheap that it kind of takes away excuses from people when they say they can't afford, you know, so many supplements. It's like, mm-hmm. well, you can make, you can make a lot of supplements at home. People are even using borax internally, which I mm. have messed around with. Um, but yeah, you made an interesting point about the copper bisglycinate. Like how much of that is actually the amino acid? I think it's like half or more or something. Mm. Like labels are actually kind of misleading, right? On supplements because you have to take that into account. So you're getting, you know, say you take, you know, 20 milligrams of copper bisglycinate, maybe, I don't know. 10 let's just say just you know you get half of that as copper and, and then, then of how course, how much of that do you absorb right? exactly because jason <laughs> says like if you have 10 milligrams of that you're only getting like one milligram and the higher you go the less you get so there's so many like hoops you have to jump through that like copper ends up seeming like one of those things that kind of if you just go like if you just force it like you will get it it will kind of ruin a few beverages but it's definitely worth it. And something that I've been doing with it just because we have some uh, acerola cherry powder around for some vitamin C. And um, yeah, that combo, I really feel it's just like getting things like absolutely going. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I remember <laughs> the first time I megadosed it during the Adam Bergstrom interview, I was extremely nauseous and that was only topical. Mm-hmm. But that was my first time doing a ton of it. And yeah, it gets kind of tricky because it raises your requirements for other things like Jason talks about zinc and ascorbic acid and then potentially a bunch of other stuff we don't know about chromium, libdenum, Mm -hmm. who knows. And so it gets kind of tricky when you start supplementing isolates, you know, like I sell the K2 and the E because to me, those are countering things that we've been megadosing uh, like excess calcium and, you know, canola oil or whatever, but you know, with this, it, it kind of makes things a little more complicated, which is why I think Morley tries to simplify it and just promotes, you know, beef liver. And, you know, I think like under 10 milligrams or even five milligrams or something of copper bisglycinate a day, you know, nowhere near a hundred like Jason's mm-hmm. <laughs> using. Yeah, for when I started just getting really serious with it, actually, that was also at the same time I was, I've been for a while kind of consistently consuming like 100 grams of beef liver a day. Mm -hmm. So I definitely had like, you know, a decent amount of zinc to balance it out. I would have my like pretty frequent oysters throughout the week to, again, make sure I'm getting enough zinc. But 
recently I cut out the beef liver just to see like, you know, if it is going to make that big of a change or if I'm going to start experiencing some of the negative side effects associated with it. And frankly speaking, I haven't yet. So, you know, I guess I'm going to keep pushing it. And then if I ever like feel like I'm on the verge of starting to experience diminishing returns from it, then, you know, I'm just going to cut it out for a little bit, going to reintroduce the beef liver, just stick with that for a bit and then, you know, see if I feel like reintroducing it sometime. Have you ever gotten any blood tests like um, to see your copper and zinc status or anything? I don't think I've ever gotten like a serious blood test, to be mm. honest. And the last time, so I, I donated blood maybe like three months ago now. And I think the only other time I gave blood before that was for, they were checking to see if I had some kind of infection. And like, I just have the worst veins to like poke and prod around to find like, a good spot to stick to get blood out of that i'm just super like hesitant to that because it, it is a nightmare trying to get blood out of me i remember you were saying that yeah and it's it's not fun when they stick all the way through the vein like they did to me this year <laughs> it actually it didn't hurt hurt at all but it was just kind of like Wow, that sucks. Now I have the bruise. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thankfully, like the last time I gave blood, my family friend who's a nurse, like literally just did it for me. So mm -hmm. she was absolutely like steady hand Luke and just took it out of me, no problem. But the time before that, oh my God, they started in my right arm, they gave up, they went to my left arm, and then they went back to my right arm. And by the end of it, I was just feeling like a pin cushion. I was like, this is something I don't want to do again. <laughs> Yeah, I posted about this thing. I think it's called uh, Venue Logic. This company, I think it's only, um, they're not selling retail at this point, but it's like a AI controlled robotic um, thing that you put your arm in. It's like mm -hmm. a robot and then it sticks you, but it finds your veins via like infrared sensors and stuff. Yeah, I, I've seen those used in the hospitals. And those are super fucking cool to look at. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's crazy just how like effective that works. And I'm sure with like, you know, actual like algorithms behind it, like it's definitely going to be better than human. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. As long as it's not like, uh, what is it? Sophia or Hans that's behind it, right? The, the AI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as long as it just doesn't turn into Skynet and it just starts stabbing people, I think we're good. Yeah. Um, well, so, so you did the copper experiment. Um, you're taking a break from beef liver to see if you feel that. And just kind of going off, off symptoms, because that's another argument. Like, you can't just go off symptoms. Uh, you have to get tests to kind of see where you're at, but it's tricky with vitamins and minerals, right? Especially like fat soluble vitamins, which are not in your blood, largely in your blood, they're in your, in your liver and in your tissues. Um, I mean, th same thing. I've been researching like ascorbic acid, you know, for months and seeing the, like, yeah, you have the plasma concentration, but then it'll diffuse like into the retina, into the brain, into the adrenal, and, you know, into the, everywhere in the body um and you can't really see that with a blood test so i can see the validity in the argument to just go by symptoms but it's a little tricky right because you could just start chasing your tail and people oh, get absolutely erotic about <laughs> the funny thing about me is that like you know my dive into health wasn't really driven particularly by any sort of symptom because like even till this day like i don't really have any like pronounced issue in my life that i'm trying to like fix so you know just based off of the fact that you know i ate a lot of cereal as a kid there's a fuck ton of iron in that like it's just safe to assume that i need something to help balance and regulate that in my body and i really feel like copper was like just one of those things that made sense for somebody in my case yeah yeah absolutely um are you taking any other supplements or Honestly, the only thing that I've been doing kind of consistent is just aspirin, just mm -hmm. plain old, like pure aspirin powder. And I feel like that is something that since I started it has been just making such a positive impact on my recovery and my overall well being that, you know, it's something that, you know, I've got like five bottles of just pure aspirin powder in my closet just because I know it's something that I use consistently. And it, every time I use it, like I can always notice that, like, thyroid mimicking like effect of it 
obviously the inflammation reduction is something else, but it just leaves me feeling really good, really warm, and just like very mentally clear. And it's funny because, you know, it's obviously advertised. It's just like, you know, a fever reducer, pain reliever, and yet it does so much more than that. Wow, that's interesting. I think I still have a bag of the powder laying around somewhere that was for horse use or something, or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, but yeah, that's probably new to a lot of people listening to this because, you know, they say, oh, that's, you know, it's a chemical or it's, it's uh, unnatural. I had my friend Ben Belty on, I think it was like a year and a half ago, and he's like an ancestral guy, you know, sells wild rice. And, we had a show uh, called like ancestral aspirin and he was Mm. saying there used to be a lot more, or there's a theory that there used to be a lot more uh, willow trees and over the centuries, those have decreased and the, the willow bark contains that uh, salicylic acid that, you know, aspirin compound basically. Uh, And so essentially we were getting more of that ancestrally than we are today when there were more, you know, willow trees around Mm because the animals were getting it in their system. We were eating the animals and that, that kind of made sense to me. I mean, I don't know. I forget what he said, what decimated the willow tree population, but yeah, it's an interesting uh, idea. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. But apart from that, something else that's kind of been an on and off experiment is actually just pure urea Mm -hmm. because um, that is a really potent thing. Uh, booster of CO2 in the body. And my logic is a lot of, you know, pre-workout supplements or like pump supplements, they usually take the road of nitric oxide boosting and nitric oxide is definitely something you don't want to have like elevated so much. And one of the things that Pete says is uh, CO2 is just as potent as a vaseline dilator as nitric oxide. So I've been taking like up to 10 grams before the gym and I can definitely vouch for that claim that like you know i'm definitely getting a significantly larger pump than i would be if i didn't so you know it's definitely expanding blood vessels and with that of course comes just more blood flow more nutrients and then better opportunities for cells to actually get damaged to be repaired to grow muscle is that like a urine extract because i know they use that in a lot of cosmetic products and it's actually in my uh, diesel, diesel exhaust fluid it's interesting when i look at the label oh, in my def for my diesel truck urea is like 70 percent, i think of the ingredient yeah, it, it, it's i think it's just like a combination of ammonia and co2 but when it's in the body it just kind of you know the ammonia gets filtered out by the kidneys and you're just left with the co2 in the bloodstream mm-hmm. And I forget where it's synthesized from. I, I remember the website explicitly say, stating that it's not from urine, which is a you know a bit of a relief. But um, yeah, I know it's also used as like fertilizer and whatnot. But uh, you know, people drink turpentine, so I don't feel so weird for using urea. I wonder if that's the benefit that the urine therapy people are saying because I. Years ago, I had a guy, Yogi Zen, stay with me with my roommates at my first apartment. And he was like aging urine in my mason jars above my fireplace. <laughs> it was like rubbing it on his skin on our back patio. And I was on a essentially an algae diet back then. So I was trying to bring my blue-green algae elixir to work. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have a mason jar because he had peed in all of them. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, you got to do what you got to do, I guess. <laughs> But yeah, me wondering, maybe that's the benefit that they feel because they, 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 they claim like, and I don't think they're lying if they feel so much better drinking their urine, maybe it's the urea aspect that's giving them the, the benefit there. Yeah, definitely topically because, you know, one of the main things and the reason for it being in a lot of cosmetic products is that it helps balance out like the liquids within cell membranes and whatnot. So if you have something like, you know, uh, psoriasis or whatnot, it's going to be like a really potent thing to calm that down and just let everything return to like homeostasis more or less. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. I'll, I'll leave that to my male goat. See, <laughs> they like to, they like the bucks like to pee on themselves to track the females. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting though, the, the CO2 versus nitric oxide thing, it seems like NO is an evil. It's just, you don't want it like chronically increased, right? Exactly. Hmm. 
And it's funny because, you know, like I was saying, this is just a regular product where the main appeal is like, oh, nitric oxide boosting capabilities. And it's like, yeah, it's going to help, you know, obviously explain, expand blood vessels and whatnot, but at what cost? Like that's going to eventually like lead to oxidative damage on the system. And honestly, I don't think that's worth it. And at least in my case, it's absolutely a better choice using the urea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so moving into uh, uh, exercise and, and strength training, uh, I was telling you before we started recording, uh, I don't have much experience. I mean, I used to go to like Gold's Gym and 24-hour fitness with my friends. Uh, I can't remember what whey shake I was drinking. I think it was in soy-based or something it's for years. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, my you know, basic movement here, like I don't deadlift or use dumbbells here at, at this point, it's just moving and farming and homesteading. Uh, I'm just forced to be outside and get sunlight mm -hmm. and, and move my body. Um, and I guess I just can kind of jump in with that. Like, do you think lifting weights, I guess it depends what you, what you, your goal is, but do you think if you're like, homesteading with animals and growing food and hunting and foraging like you need to like set time aside to lift or what are your thoughts on that honestly in that case i don't really think it's so necessary because you know there is something called farmer strength <laughs> that's just because like farmers are doing you know sunrise to sundown they're working consistently they're never really pushing themselves to failure, but they're doing like, the same things again and again and again. That's such an effective way to build like an insane amount of strength over time. And when you look at it, like strength is one of the best factors to look at if you want to just have a guesstimate for longevity. Like if I'm not mistaken, like being on the higher end of like strength. And when I say strength, I mean basic metrics like just being able to like hang from a bar for some time or just like your grip strength being able to get up from a chair like the stronger you are i think across the board you experience like a three times reduction in all cause mortality and that's just from you know just being fit mm -hmm. yeah that's a good point um yeah it's interesting whenever i go to the city and you know, I look in the window and not to say I'm, you know, higher up here on my high horse in the mountains <laughs> off grid property, but just my observation when I go to San Diego or whatever to visit family and friends and, you know, walk by a gym and just see people on the, the elliptical thing or the treadmill, mm -hmm. it just, it seems like a big factory farm and, and, you know, under artificial light, working out indoors. And what I appreciate uh, about what you're doing is you're modeling you know, you're outside, you're in the sun, barefoot. My friend, Justin of extreme health radio does the same thing is, you know, he lifts his weights out outside his garage, you know, with full sun exposure. And that makes a huge difference, right? Oh, absolutely. Like, it, it's just like one of those things, like you're literally stacking different things that are going to lead to improved health, just, you know, grounding, you're getting the sun exposure. And of course you're exercising, which comes with a whole host of benefits whether it be obviously from gaining muscle and strength or just from the fact that you're breaking a sweat you're stimulating your lymphatic system you're getting things moving all those things are contributing to overall well-being mm -hmm. yeah I, I thought i saw a study years ago um it was it was basically showing how artificial light uh, breaks down uh, our bone matrix mm -hmm. and uh, basically makes our bones like brittle. Um, yeah, I can't remember the the specific details. This was like six, five or six years ago. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is funny. Like the, just the typical like gym environment, just how like you know, yes, you can use it to help your health, but in and of itself, it's so like non conducive to health because you're under that blue light, you're crowded, you're constantly bombarded by like, the billion VOCs for all the cleaners that they're using. And just, 
you know, if, if your gym has like a pool or a sauna, like, you know, there's chlorine in the air and there's so much. And then like, you know, kind of expanding from that, just like the whole, like funny enough, my first thread into like having a more information based Instagram is actually a, as they call it, Fitstagram, where I was just, you know, trying to just, you know, I, I did, did protein bar reviews, man. I, I did, I posted lifts and I posted protein bar reviews, but it's so funny how like warped of a perception that space is and how much it misconstrues the idea of health. Because I feel like so many people end up thinking like, oh, like I'm following this pro bodybuilder and his workouts are like the most grueling thing in the world. And, you know, that's what I need to be doing. And it's like, no, that's absolutely not the case. Like, honestly, just starting with the best, like the minimum effective dose of training will be the best decision for like nine out of 10 people. Because not only do you allow yourself so much room to grow from that, but the majority of the benefits that you actually get from increasing your physical fitness is just going from not being fit to being moderately fit. So you don't need to go super crazy with everything. And obviously, you know, not even having to jump into all the anabolics and what crap they're eating and all the other powders they're promoting. But there really isn't that big of a jump that people have to make in regards to their health with just working out. Like they don't need to take it to the extreme and, and especially not every day. Like it's just something that, you know, you need to touch up on every now and then, and it's going to benefit for the rest of your life. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, I definitely have taken the, the all or nothing approach. I did. I don't know if you were following me then, um, but I did the almond raw protocol for like six months, I think really strict, and then maybe like nine months, you know, total. But it was essentially 23 hour a day fasting, uh, one hour eating window, and with oh, basically like beans, uh, soy milk protein shake, with like all the amino acids and soy milk that I would make myself. And usually a big bowl of beans. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I actually got pretty jacked. I mean, it was incredible. I wasn't eating, you know, any animal products at all. And I saw pictures. I mean, I was ripped. Um, but I was deadlifting, you know, pretty much seven days a week with a hex bar. Oh, and yeah, that was, I mean, it definitely did a number of my back over time. <laughs> I can imagine <laughs> Yeah, and that's something that I feel like a lot of people don't take into consideration. It's just like how, like, people get into fitness because they obviously want to start caring about themselves, but they don't realize that too much of a good thing can be bad. And I feel like, especially with fitness, the diminishing returns that you get if you aren't like 100% with things like, you know, your nutrition, your recovery is going to catch up with you so quickly. And there's so many people in, the fitness space that just have this mentality of just grinding through it and they take pride in that and it, it's so silly for me to like look at these people that you know train seven days a week they're absolutely dripping sweat consistently and they're like oh you know like you get in what you put out and like I, I train three or four days a week i'm in and out of the gym in like an hour and you know i'm on par with these people like it, it's really it's just one of those funny things that I think has become such a norm that people just refuse to question it almost. And that's something that I really hope to change because, you know, like really starting with just the bare minimum and working from there and just focusing on recovery, because frankly speaking, like if I could do anything, like I would have half the routine I currently have, but if I could recover a hundred percent from it, I would be completely okay with that because the recovery is where things grow. That's where the benefits happen. And sure, you know, you're burning extra calories when you're working out and everything, but the real magic happens when you recover from what you've done to yourself. And I don't think people really give that the weight that it has. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, that's and sleep has a huge role to play there, right? And I oh, think absolutely. A lot of people are like partying downtown every weekend, 
like staying up late. Um, I have a lot of night owl friends, so I, I've seen it. And, and to me, I've noticed if I go to bed past 11 p.m., it wrecks my health and there's nothing I could do. I, my next day is just, I have to do so much mitigation, hyperbaric mm-hmm. chamber, take a nap, you know, don't do as much mental work. Just so many things are off just with that timing, just going to bed one hour later at midnight. I've, I've tried it ad nauseum and it's the same result. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, I, I know exactly where you're coming from because I'm actually like a, for work, I'm a caretaker of a disabled guy and I, I work nights. So, you know, it's a 15 hour shift. I come in at four, I leave at seven in the morning. And, mm-hmm. You know, my boss is cool. She says like, as long as I can wake up to an alarm going off, I can sleep. Uh, but I, I, I don't know, it's hard for me to sleep at work as much as I wish I could say I do that. But, um, yeah, those days after and the days during, like I'm trying to focus so much on just like doing everything in my power to, you know, reduce just systemic inflammation, just put my body closer to homeostasis, which I know would be impossible. But, you know, I you really have to actively be a participant in recovery as much as you are with training. Mm-hmm. Did you say 16 hour work days? Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's yeah, fine. <laughs> so from when to when uh usually lately it's just been four o'clock four o'clock in the afternoon to seven in the morning so it's actually 15 oh. but yeah <laughs> it's basically 16 yeah that's that's nuts uh my first job was stocking at pet smart overnight and i think that was I, I would start at 10 p.m and i would leave at i think 6 a.m and that just three months of that was horrible it was so harsh mm-hmm. <laughs> not to mention i almost got crushed by a pallet of dog food because oh the, the forklift driver didn't know what he was doing <laughs> <laughs> but yeah especially when you're in a situation where you know you're basically being robbed of my sleep like the way i look at work for me it's like i'm literally trading my health for income sometimes but just focusing on getting actual sunlight right after those days has been like one of the biggest game changers for me because obviously you know winter and spring like weather wasn't that great but now that it's summer like the day the the second day after my shifts are done like that morning workout just feeling the sun like i just feel like i'm absorbed and it's crazy how much of an impact it makes just like on my mental health alone that's fascinating because I, I've experimented so much with sunbathing over the years from like that quantum health perspective. Mm-hmm. And what I've noticed in myself is if I go to bed really late or I'm just underslept or got a poor night's sleep, I don't like, I don't handle the sun as well. Like I get sunburned easier and I feel like it fatigues me more. And I'm sure there's like a biochemical reason for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's super interesting. Maybe it was a copper deficiency. I don't know. <laughs> it's interesting, though, you said protein bar reviews because uh, I read a book <laughs> years ago, <laughs> Vegan Bodybuilding, Robert mm-hmm. Cheek. And he was a, I don't know if he still is, but he was a heavy promoter in that book of uh, Cliff Bars for vegans. And I tried it, I think, for a week or two. And I'm like, this makes me feel horrible. Yeah, those things sit like glue in your stomach. <laughs> <laughs> those are they just refuse to be digested if you ask me like they're tasty going down but coming out you're gonna feel it yeah probably need like multiple uh colon hydrotherapy <laughs> sessions <laughs> <laughs> did you ever get into that colon cleansing really i haven't but there is one colon hydrotherapist that was actually recommended by one of my anthropology teachers from back in the day and i've been you know like i've toyed with the idea i haven't fully committed yet but it is something like on the list of like you know health things to do just like you know th- there's a place near me that does uh both uh hyperbaric oxygen therapy and also they have a float tank so you know i'm planning on making a trip there one day just testing it out and you know really seeing just how far i can push things within limit. nice yeah that the combination of those two cover so many bases it's incredible um I've noticed both are incredible if, if you get a poor night's sleep, the hyperbaric and the float tank. Mm-hmm. If I had to pick one, it would probably be the, the float tank because it, it really kind of simulates sleep. I mean, I could never 
take a nap in there. I know some people can fall asleep in the sensory deprivation tank. Uh, for me, my mind just doesn't allow me to. I don't know if it knows, you know, I'm not in bed or whatever. <laughs> oh, is that, that's really curious because I'm, I wonder if like, you know, maybe because you're so genuinely sensory deprived, maybe like GABA starts to upregulate and you get that like washing effect in the brain that it's known for. So that's, that's mm -hmm. really interesting. Mm -hmm. Have you ever experimented with uh, melatonin? We were talking about that before. before so I have, but I think my pills are like 300, either 300 or 100 micrograms. Mm. So that's, if I'm not mistaken, akin to what is produced in a night's sleep and melatonin's half-life is something close to half an hour. So, you know, I try and make sure I have that right before I go to sleep. And it definitely helps with just like the immediate, like you're falling into a deep sleep quicker, but I, it, this is absolutely just like a John thing, but whenever I go to sleep after work, I'm always up by like noon. Like I physically, I, I think my body, it's just regretting all those days spent during like college and high school during the summer when I wake up at like three in the afternoon. I don't think my body wants to do that anymore. So, you know, I, as much as I wish I could sleep more on those days, I really just physically can. Yeah. Do you have blackout curtains in your yeah. bedroom? Hmm. Like blackout curtains, earplugs, like off the ground like that. Like I, I try and do everything that I can, like down to like mouth tape and like a nasal dilator. Like I'm trying to be in another world and still like it, it, I, I don't have to set an alarm. It's always either 12. Sometimes if my body's feeling nice, I can wake up at one. That's very rare, but you know, it is what it is. And honestly, like, yeah, I can tell that like I'm not running at a hundred percent, but by no means does that really like impede me because my work is super intensive. Mm -hmm. so, do you combine mouth taping and the nasal dilator? Yes, that's one of my wow. favorite things. Like wow. that, just the sleep I get from that combo alone is like next level. Just wow. because, you know, you're obviously, I mean, you're doing nothing but just breathing better, and when you cut out the ability for your body to breathe out the mouth like you're really just honed in and it just gets like rhythmic and i, I think just focusing on breathing as i'm falling asleep with that in just puts me out like a light wow that, i'm gonna try that tonight because i've only ever done one or the other and i guess i just don't want to shave my whole mustache off and beard <laughs> but that's that's required if you mouth tape right so <laughs> um that's interesting yeah, I'm definitely going to try that because I've never been a mouth breather. Even growing up, I was just a nose breather. Mm. But even if that's the case, in the middle of the night, unless you have a girlfriend or a wife to tell you, a partner, that that you're snoring, mm. you don't know, right? Exactly. <laughs> and, and a lot of people that are nose breathers during the day are intermittent mouth breathers. My understanding is it creates a state of like, acute hypoxia so your brain essentially doesn't get oxygen for a period mm -hmm. of time which even if it's 10 or 15 seconds or something that's still significant right oh absolutely mm. yeah that's that's interesting i'm i'm definitely going to give that a shot did you ever uh try like turning off the breaker box like uh like oh, electricity or <laughs> yeah yeah that, that that's off we've got those on timers and everything so mm -hmm. right around that time everything gets killed and you know we living in an apartment there's only so much you can do but i think every possible step apart from just like literally wrapping the bedroom in like an emf blocking like sheet is being done so yeah we're definitely good on that front nice are you grounding a uh, rod to earth or no, no we're, we're having to use the socket because we're on the second floor so hmm. yeah it's such an interesting one like you know the one time if that i stay at a hotel you know you can't throw it out the hotel window it's all ground mm -hmm. to the third prong in the wall um but it, it seems like it's a dirty electricity issue it was my understanding that it can like jump over to the ground essentially mm -hmm. and so if you kind of measure the dirty electricity readings or have stets or filters around or it's not an issue, then you don't have to worry. Um, but that's the combo I do in like a hotel. I put in those stets or filters plus I ground. Um, oh, yeah. 
But next experiment I want to do, I don't know if it'll work. I, I got like a Faraday canopy. <laughs> you could just like put we it in the ceiling. Up those two. <laughs> oh my God. That, that, that really is like, there's, I, I can't imagine something past that. Right. Right. Like that, that is the end game. Like that's, that's the nuclear option when it comes to just not letting yourself fall victim to the trifles of society. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you're in a big city. I mean, I, I, I can't imagine. I don't know if I'm just more sensitive or more aware, but I just, I feel it. If I like stay in San Diego with my family for like three or four nights, I just feel so tired. Mm. And uh, I get back here and it's like, oh, nice. It's yeah. Just, House can be achieved. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I have friends that like still don't believe like the EMF stuff. And like, I remember one time I was in a car, I was sitting in the back seat. One of my friends was driving shopping. And he just like casually kept his phone like, on his lap, like right over his parts. And I'm like, dude, like just, just move it a little bit, please, for me. And he's like, why? It's like just nuking your, your balls with like, non-ionizing radiation like please just and he's just like no no like uh, you're just like you're being dramatic and i'm like okay dude like i'm at the point where if i i, I can't keep a laptop on my lap because like i feel that current and like it just like this hazy cloud like radiates from it and like i can sense it no matter how close it is to my body and it's just it's very real and it's silly to think that like people are still ignoring that. Maybe you should have told him just to like sun his balls. Or... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Gotta make sure you get the friend in that right. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, you know, often hear like, you know, a friend of a friend dies of uh, cancer or, uh, you know, a brain tumor or something like that. And it's, you know, I'm sure we all know uh, people you know, extended family or, you know, friends or friend of friends that just get diagnosed with something like cancer. And it just seems like out of the blue and, you know, they just get scared into the conventional system of chemo. And um, I guess people just, just forget about those cases. You know, it's like election time every four years, just amnesia. <laughs> you know? No, absolutely. And, you know, I'm sure if you went to like, the the homes of like half those people they probably have like a router that's running 24 7 maybe in their bedroom and it's like how are you expected to heal when you're constantly stressing out your body you're messing up those calcium channels you're producing more nitric oxide you're just creating this cascade of like responses that are negative that your body needs to deal with before it's able to take care of any other bigger fish when you donated blood I think we talked about it. You felt like a, like a boost, right? You said for, oh, for a absolutely. few days. Like I, I got, I, like, dare I say, like I, I was a little bit high off of giving blood for a bit, but I will say after maybe a week, I started to get like a little dizzy occasionally. Like if I was like, just, you know, like I just, instead of sitting, I'll squat. And whenever I would get up quick, I would definitely feel like, Ooh, like a little bit woozy, but you know, I, I just like, up to my nutrition across the board and within like another week, like that was gone. So that was something that I experienced for maybe like seven to 10 days. And, you know, it definitely was able to alleviate, but um, yeah, even going into it, I considered myself to be in pretty like outstanding health in regards to just like the nutrient stores in my body. But it was a bit of a reality check that that happened to me because, you know, clearly, you know, I might've been missing something and, you know, a very novel way of finding that out. <laughs> yeah it, it can definitely be like an intense detox like reaction it, it's interesting that the first time i donated blood i felt like superman and i ate like a burger and fries i think it was like a half hour or 45 minutes before i donated it was a mm -hmm. burger and fries and i think a mexican coca-cola and i felt so incredible for the next two or three days and then the second donation i rushed it a little too fast and i mm -hmm. didn't I had a snack. I didn't have a full meal before and I was exhausted and I feel like it was not a good idea to rush into it. Uh, it's definitely something, you know, you don't want to plan last minute. You want to set aside a day, make sure that you're going to eat to me a huge meal. I mean, not to Absolutely. where you're you know, super stuff, but like 
you're fully satisfied for hours. That seems to be really yeah, important. because you know at the end of the day, what are you doing? You're getting rid of like you're getting rid of blood. Like your body does not want that to be happening. The fact that it is, it's going to create such like a cascade of things where your body's just trying to recover. So you know, for all the good that it does, it definitely at the heart of it is a bit of like a stress response that you're going to have to deal with one way or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you notice uh, a reduction in EMF sensitivity after you donated? Nothing really stand out, honestly. Although I know um, typically it's something between like three and 500 mLs, I think, when you donate. And because it was literally like my, my friend borrowed a like the little thingy to go in me from the hospital and we were just kind of like emptying it into one of the jars that I use for like juice when I'm working. And yeah, I think at the end I got like close to like two or 300. So it wasn't a crazy amount, but you know, I didn't notice anything in EMF, but definitely I think now looking back on how I feel now compared to then, just an overall more like clear headedness because for a while I was definitely having issues with um just basic brain fog but at the same time you know like i work nights there's only so much i can do but since then like that has not been an issue like i've been productive at night like i'll it'll be like two in the morning i'll be researching stuff i'll be using my time wisely because you know it's a great opportunity when my guys asleep to just like do whatever i want so yeah that's awesome catch up on my life radio <laughs> exactly <laughs> Four hour Adam Bergstrom interviews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely experienced the reduction in brain fog too. So, did you have like essentially like a mobile phlebotomist? You said it was like a friend. Like, you she, just put she it was just a nurse. She stuck me and she was just <laughs> emptying it into a bottle. And I was just wow. sitting on our patient's bed while he was in his wheelchair. And yeah, it's just wow. about as ghetto as you could get, honestly. <laughs> but hey, it got the job done. You should have, did you pour it on like your house plants or? <laughs> yes. Actually, yes. Awesome. <laughs> I muted it with some water, maybe threw a little sprinkle of shilajit in there, really treated them, you know. Nice. Yeah, I just learned uh, from a few people, I guess this is a common knowledge, since I'm learning about gardening, since I'm about to put up a, a dome, mm -hmm. uh, urine diluted and i'm not getting into urine therapy i know we've talked about it a lot, <laughs> but, uh, but 10 to 1 diluted watering your plants i guess it's like a really bioavailable nitrogen source for, yeah exactly for plants so yeah and certain ones i think like tobaccos has high nitrogen needs i think tomatoes there's a there's a list so um on that topic what what are your thoughts this is completely random but on the whole uh, anti-nutrient thing that's I think it's been trending for years right like lectins phytates I I don't pay much attention to it but whenever I have foods that contain those like Hallmark anti-nutrients typically the way that we just go about preparing them is like the typical like Weston A. Price style of like either fermenting it or like really well cooking it so it's something that you don't have to really worry about it's as much of a boogeyman as they're made out to be, like most of the time, the majority is going to be neutralized by like preparing them properly. So it's not something, it's something that like back in the day, I really paid mind to, but at this point, like it, it's the least of my worries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, recently I found, and I, I think I'm late to the party, but uh, the bean diet, and you know, I, don't like diets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's this woman, Karen Hurd, that's been making the rounds, I think for the last, I don't know, six years or something. And uh, she promotes legumes because they're the, the highest source of uh, soluble fiber. Mm -hmm. So I've been going down that rabbit hole the last 24 hours or so. Um, I guess it binds to like excess adrenaline and um, all the fat soluble toxins that uh, your bile collects, you know, if you don't have enough fiber, it'll just get reabsorbed like mm -hmm. 90 to nine percent, 95 percent of it. Um, and I was essentially like fiber free, uh, for a few years, you know, on the Ray Pete thing, it was just a raw carrot once a day. Mm -hmm. That was the bulk of my fiber, maybe some rice. And I felt like that wasn't enough. Um, so 
since like re- reintroducing like raw greens and then and my first bean meal yesterday, <laughs> I felt incredible. So there, there's something interesting to the whole fiber thing. Yeah. And it's one of those things where like, there's so much stuff on like, you know, the, the normies are just like, oh, you need like a small amount. And then like the opposite ends of the spectrum of curse, like exists in the health world where you have the people saying like no fiber or high fiber, but just like literally everything else, like balance in the middle is going to work for the general population without a doubt. Like hubris and diet is something that should not exist because there is little to no situation where you can be like a hundred percent all this way and not that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been laughing at uh, Paul Saladino's uh, posts. He's like, I don't eat fish because that the mercury it's like, you know, I was there a few years ago. I, I get it, but to promote it to that huge of an audience is insane. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I personally feel amazing on fish. I, I kind of cycle it where there will be a few months where I just feel like eating a lot of it, and then I'll take a break, mm-hmm. and that just feels good for me. So yeah, and I love how you'll say stuff like that, but he doesn't take into consideration, like you know, for example, the selenium in fish that helps not absorb all those heavy metals and whatnot. It's just mm-hmm. he, he, all those people try to make it so black and white when in reality like health is a very vibrantly colored picture speaking of vibrantly colored i i realize whenever i eat fish i tend to remember my dreams more and in more detail interesting so i wonder if it's the selenium or you know different nutrients in it b vitamins i don't know i know there's like a b6 dream connection which yeah 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 i remember that yeah, I remember as a kid, like having just eating cucumbers before bed because they're high in B6. And like consistently, that would give me some pretty wild dreams. I didn't know that. Wow. Cucumbers. I'm, I'm actually growing some on my deck, so I'll have to really get those going. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the B6 thing is kind of scary because I think I've been reading a lot of vitamin C books. And I think it was uh, Carl Pfeiffer or... Uh, one of the vitamin C guys, he was saying, you know, he's a proponent of like niacin and B6. Hmm. I think it was Andrew Saul, pretty sure. And he was saying, it, you know, if you take above, I think it was like 2,000 milligrams of B6, you can cause uh, neuropathy. <laughs> and it's like irreversible nerve damage. Oh, wow. Something. But I don't know. I've been playing around with anywhere between 25 and 100 milligrams. And I feel like that's pretty safe, even 200 hmm. milligrams. I mean, that's really far away from 2000, but uh, I wonder what variables are involved there to, to cause that effect. Yeah. And of course that's like, I'm sure with like an isolated supplement, because, you know, anything that you take in isolation, the way that it just floods receptors and whatnot produces a response that isn't really what you would get when it has like, not even just cofactors, but just other nutrients coming along with it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I recently found an awesome uh, bee pollen source from uh, my uh, light water friend, Victor Sagalovsky, Russian guy. Oh, and cool. he's, he's uh, selling this bee pollen and it, it like melts in your mouth. It's like, um, it reminds me of like uh, the ice cream topping that I grew up with. I can't remember what they would put on there, but like the topping that just melts in your mouth. <laughs> <The different>. mm. <laughs> and uh, all the bee pollen I've ever had was like, grainy and hard and you almost have Mm -hmm. to chew it this one just dissolves so i know that's like an incredible source of uh of b complex vitamins so i've just been taking handfuls throughout the day (laughs) yeah Yeah, i guess maybe like there's something else in cellulose creating that like outer shell to the bee pollen so maybe Mm -hmm. it's just like some unique little bees or maybe their environment just like has them using a different source to build Mm -hmm. like that outside part yeah yeah, I recently learned uh, you can't have a hive produce, you can't get honey from a hive and bee pollen. It has to be one or the other. So if you make a beehive just for bee pollen, you won't get any honey out of it. I thought that was interesting. Oh, I mean, th- th- that makes sense now that you said it. Yeah. Be taxing those little guys too much. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, let's see. Do you want to jump into the questions? Do I feel like that might be like a good little. Uh, segue into a lot of different avenues here yeah absolutely 
we have quite a few. Um, let's see. Yeah, so how often do you need to exercise per week to see physical change? You said you just do three to four, right? Yeah, so that's three or four days of training. And during those days, typically, like, at least three of them, I'll have two sessions, one being my morning one, and then the other one being like a typical gym one. But honestly, mm -hmm. anybody looking to just improve their fitness and therefore their health, I think like, you know, maybe three going to the gym or just like having some strength component of training, like three times a week is a great starting point. And then maybe just honestly, like there's so much talk about just cardio and your zone two and all that jazz, but at the end of the day, I think most people would benefit the most from just going from like a short, like 15 to 30 minute walk after their like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, because that's just going to make sure that everything that you're eating is getting utilized effectively. And that's just going to increase your steps overall throughout the day. And, you know, just it, it, it's so low impact. It has added benefits to it. And it really is something that you don't have to like obsess over because there was a time where. I was doing like three hours of cardio on the top of like weight training and, you know, every day, which has been dreading like, Oh, okay. I woke up. Now I need to do my first hour. I go back home. I go to class. I do my gym workout. I have another hour and then I come back home. I have dinner and then I go on another hour. And like that, that's such an awful mindset to have for a long time. And like, yes, you will get benefits, but at what cost? Like at that point I was starting to get like freakishly thin. Like for reference, I'm six four, and I think at that time when I was doing that, I was down to like 140 pounds. Like I was, I was not looking great, but I I, I was like model thing. I will say that. So you know, it definitely tickled a part of my brain, but absolutely not sustainable. And I think whatever it is that has people looking forward to doing it, it's going to be like the greatest motivator. So for instance, you know, my morning workouts, I love getting out in the fresh air. I love the sun. I love getting the grounding benefits. And I just love messing around with like the 400 pounds of some odd implements that I keep in my car that my wife absolutely hates that we're driving around and everything's rattling left and right. But you know, that, that gets me so excited and eager to work out that it like helps me get out of bed. And I think if people are able to find something akin to that, that really just drags themselves into the gym. Like, you know, three days a week, it's more than enough. And then just making sure they walk enough throughout the rest of the days is, you know, the icing on top. Mm -hmm. I love that. Did, did you ever have uh, super soaker fights with friends growing up? <laughs> I, I have. <laughs> that, was, that was my main exercise growing up. I mean, it, it seemed like uh, every summer, just all summer would be out there running around the neighborhood. Now. Super soaker commando over here. Wow. <laughs> Probably like three or four blocks we'd take over and just have multiple, <laughs> you know, in between like a couple houses and just. <laughs> oh man, that sounds great. <laughs> we also had lemon wars because we there were a bunch of lemon trees in Southern California, and you know we'd pick like lemons that are <laughs> overripe. Like lemons are people. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> We need to bring back that and uh, and water balloons too. We had a lot of those, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. I guess they have crazy contraptions for that now. I think they have like bazookas. Yeah, I saw, I saw like there's a uh, reusable water balloons now. Like that's great. I, I can uh, like as much as I think like being a kid now will kind of suck. Like having reusable water balloons and just being able to like help my friends like that, that's, that's kind of redeeming. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but yeah, I, I like the, going back to what you said, the short walk after breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I think that's really practical. And that's something I've been trying to get motivated to do. It's just, um, you know, just been juggling a lot here, trying to, you know, set up my house and property and just a lot of stuff juggling, but just to even make the time for a 10 minute walk or something, I think, mm -hmm. you know, there's no excuse for that. Um, Although I do have to be careful because <laughs> I see the deer and the moose fighting each other. Oh my God. All the animals are, you know, getting out and I see a mama moose with her baby calf. And that's like the most dangerous situation, right? Like oh, a bear, bear and her cub. So 
bring my bear spray in my walk, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I'm not mistaken, the um, effects of something as simple as like a walk after a meal, like not saying high insulin after eating is bad, but like it can reduce insulin almost as effectively as something like metformin. So yeah, it's just one of those things that if you're chasing longevity and just overall health, it's such a small thing you can implement that's going to have like a pretty drastic benefit. Do you think that's like a could be a primary cause of why people have like chronic gas and bloating too, and even um, maybe constipation? Oh, absolutely. Not like, moving enough after they eat. Yeah. Uh, what is it? Mobility and motility, like they're almost the same thing. Like those morning workouts, like holy cow, every time I come back, like I'm already like I'm rushing it to go number two just because like I've been moving so much and like I'm basically creating my own like peristalsis to get things moving. And yeah, it doesn't even need to be something crazy. Like even if I'm just like foam rolling or just basic stretching or like we were just talking about walking, like that's really usually enough to just help stimulate the bowels to empty. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get into rebounding, like jumping on a trampoline? I found one on the side of the road a few years ago and I kept it in my garage gym and I used it occasionally, not enough to like be consistent and see benefits, but it's, it's definitely fun. And I think that fun aspect of it is something that could help people get like, you know, consistent with it. And of course that's really important, but you know, just, just thinking about it, like bouncing up and down, like having that moment of like weightlessness and just like, things moving like yeah that's absolutely like another great option yeah the for years like when i was doing that crazy <laughs> almond raw protocol with you know black coffee and no sugar and fasting i was using a whole uh, vibration plate oh, okay I think, I think it was dave asprey's <laughs> and i'd be drinking my hibiscus tea or whatever fasting on it for mm -hmm. you know 15 minutes but there were times where it made my entire all, my whole legs was were sore for a while after doing mm. it. Like I had just done a sprint, just basically squatting on it for 15 minutes. Yeah. And I'm sure like that vibration, is just like super potent moving the length, like as something that doesn't really have like a pump system to move it around. Something that's like simple. It's just, you know, like, like me shaking it. That's definitely going to help move stuff around. And I'm sure that like, you know, clears congestion and just helps ensure that things are flowing correctly. Um, this is a, a good one, probably a common question. What if you're having trouble building muscle? So typically, like I said earlier, if it was like, if I could either have like an amazing routine and no recovery or half a routine or like a half decent routine and a hundred percent recovery, I would always go with the latter. And I think the training, as long as you're actually incurring enough stimulus on muscle to encourage a response, you're good on that front. And there isn't like any rocket surgery that needs to be performed in order to like see what the problem is. You should start looking at nutrition. And honestly, probably the easiest way would just be increasing protein throughout the day. Like obviously calories as a whole too, but just making sure that you're getting like anywhere from, I think like 0.8 grams per kilo of body weight is a good starting point. And I, this is something I've experimented with pretty intensely over the past year, actually. Um, I dropped my protein to, you know, my weight right now is like 210, 215. And I dropped it down to 100. And I was doing that for a like four or five months. And honestly, I didn't notice that much of a negative impact on my overall physique. But when I bumped it up to 150 and now I'm trying to get closer to 200, that's when I just started to feel like, yeah, like it, it really is doing something in regards to recovery. And I do feel like I'm putting on more tissue effectively. So yeah, if you're having trouble building muscle, uh, eat more and just make sure that you're getting enough protein. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the protein thing because that's something I really wanted to uh, talk about in this episode. Uh, so I've done, you know, I, I, I was fruitarian for a while, getting pretty much zero protein for years, just like soak nuts and seeds, mm -hmm. however much of that I absorbed. Um, 
And we had a question. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, essential amino acids? Because I know, like I kind of progressed from taking like whey protein, forget if it's isolate or concentrate, or I switched back and forth hmm. to like, you know, branch chain amino acids, which are the three. And then I discovered EAAs, which are hmm. what, I think nine amino acids. Yeah. Um, so so yeah. the BCAAs, I feel like that's just like a, it, for nine times out of 10, that's absolutely like a gimmick. That's just been like the cornerstone for half of what the fitness industry sells. EAAs are definitely a better option. When I was trying to do like a consistent full body everyday regimen, that's what I would use. I think I would use like 10 grams of that mixed with like orange juice or just whatever kind of juice that was high in sugar as an intro workout drink to make sure that even while I'm training, I'm not letting my body experience any like drought of nutrition. And I think it definitely could play a role in certain situations like that. But more often than not, if your nutrition parry workout like just throughout the rest of the day is solid, I don't think that's something that you really need to like invest in. But certain situations, especially for instance, if I if I wanted to do more fasted sort of workouts in the morning, like I would just have like a coffee, a little bit of sugar and milk, and maybe I would dump in some EAAs just to make sure that, you know, I have enough fuel to get through the workout without my body like really freaking out and starting to feel like it's starving. Yeah. I'd imagine like the amount of meals someone consumes, like if someone's eating two meals versus three, it's probably harder to get to hit that protein mark i mean oh absolutely let and, alone 200 grams right <laughs> yeah and I, I think there's research saying that you know there's only so much protein that can be used in the goal of muscle protein synthesis per meal and i think like spanned across like three hours depending on your body weight i think it was something like if you're 150 pounds you can use up to like 40 grams of protein for the purpose of building muscle if you're 200 pounds you can go up to like 50 and if you're 250 plus you can use around 60 grams of protein but you know it, it really is such a small thing and compared to the rest of your day it working out is such a small time that i think you should just focus more on ensuring that you have quality nutrition around it because the majority of like the fitness like influencer type of products they just are they exist to be sold they the benefit they offer is so small and yes they can apply to like very niche like people in certain situations so i'm not completely bashing them but for the regular person just trying to get fit i don't really think that's something necessary if you want to incorporate it definitely do it like I did, like have it with the juice so you have some sugar too. Otherwise, your insulin might get a little bit wonky, especially when you're exercising. But overall, I don't think that's something that you know people need. Uh, is there is there a time when the carnivore diet can be beneficial? Uh, I don't know when there's no food around. What's that? When there's no food around. <laughs> when, when you can't get any carbs and you're you know, kind of forced into it. I mean, maybe if you're like really, really sensitive in the gut and nothing else is working and you need like a starting point at least, I'm sure it could be effective for certain people. But even then, you're not really addressing the issues. You're just kind of skirting around them. So, yeah, it could be, but there's definitely better ways. But, you know, they do take more of an investment of your own time research into figuring out like how to accomplish whatever fix you have to do mm -hmm. um let's see a few questions on creatine um does creatine actually help you build muscle mass uh and how to prevent the water retention that happens from creatine okay so yeah <laughs> they, they kind of answered their own question because the <laughs> yes it will help build muscle just because of the way creatine acts with like adenosine triphosphate. It, when that gets used up, it becomes diphosphate. Creatine can jump in and immediately turn it back into triphosphate. So you have like more sustained energy more or less, but the water retention is honestly like kind of one of the benefits to it because that's just increasing the amount of water a cell can hold. And especially if you're trying to 
achieve more muscle mass for more like through like you know hypertrophy training and trying to achieve like myofibular uh growth which is just like cells getting so big that you know they tear and then they grow um yeah creatine will help with that i don't think the, the water issue is that bad if you're experiencing it to the point where like you know your midsection is starting to like lose definition or you just feel like you're really like holding water like for instance like one of the easiest ways to check if you have like issues with water retention is if you're wearing socks and you turn them up uh, and you take them off if you have like a mark from where the top of the sock was that's usually a sign that you're holding like a little bit of extra water and if that's the case then you know maybe just take some like dandelion tea because that's a pretty simple with diuretic having a little bit of apple cider vinegar like i think a cup or like a half cup to a cup worth of apple cider vinegar with water to dilute it before you go to bed like you'll be pissing like a racehorse in the morning and you'll definitely need some of that excess water but i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing in regards to creatine that it makes you hold water yeah it's interesting about the socks interesting uh thing i heard years ago was cutting the top of your sock uh, you know, that elastic band mm -hmm. to increase circulation, but I don't know how much of a difference that would make. I guess it depends how tight the socks are, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just like one of those little things. I mean, shit, like you just go at it with like a pair of scissors. And, like, uh, as long as they're not like slipping down your feet after that, like just why not? Kind of right. Yeah. People say just go barefoot, but I don't know. There's situations where, it's not always best. So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, how to deal with joint and tendon pain? Um, so I think something that a lot of people have a proclivity to do is just that if they have an issue with, say, their elbow or their knees, or you know, in my case, my back. Like my back has been on and off, like an issue for a hot minute. But people get scared of that pain, and that makes them restrict their movement when in reality they should be continuing to do movement using those problem areas except with better exercise selection or just movement selection in general because when you're moving you know you're obviously increasing the amount of blood that gets to an area the nutrition in the blood is ultimately going to be what helps repair things so you know just don't be scared of moving Honestly, like it really is like use it or lose it type of stuff. For instance, like, you know, my dad's a great example of this because back in Nam, he took like shrapnel to the leg. He blew out his back jumping out of like an AC-130 carrying an M60. And like, you know, he, for a lack of better a word, he's kind of been like trapped in his body for the majority of my life. And it's awful to see, but it, it's just, you know, being able to move is like mobility is freedom in that sense. And I think the fear around it, it's such a like bodily response, but the pain isn't necessarily like, Oh, like, you know, something is getting worse and worse. Like, it's just fear of your body, like expecting something to go wrong. But if you're able to, you know, effectively train it and just work with it through ranges of motion where it's actually comfortable and slowly progress and develop that strength again in those areas, then you know we'll be able to recover totally for instance um my elbow my right elbow has been a bit problematic because i was going crazy with push pressing for almost like a month and you know i haven't had elbow pain in probably like close to two years and all i did wrist movement and like light tricep movement and over the course of like maybe like two weeks the, the pain resolved itself so it, it's the worst thing you can do is just letting it sit there. And I think that's something that a lot of people need to accept. And yeah, you can do supplements and stuff. You know, you can do your collagen, you can increase your vitamin C or ascorbic acid because both of those are cofactors to developing like tendons and ligaments. But the main thing you should be doing is just not stop. That's awesome. And there could be like a, and maybe it's, it's a combination of like nutritional deficiencies too, right? Oh, absolutely. Hmm. Um, this is actually a really good question because tomorrow's show is on genetics. <laughs> My oh, friend, uh, Tyler, uh, and what are your thoughts on genetics impacting your training style? 
intensity, you know, basically how you work out, body composition. Like, do you think that plays a role? So I think that's something to like, you know, at least be aware of just for like the sake of conversation. But at the end of the day, I don't think that's like the biggest thing. Like, yeah, certain populations can be higher or lower in biostatin. And for example, like that's going to be one of the most limiting factors in how much muscle you can grow. And other populations will have like different ways of distributing fat across the body. But, you know, I, I think the main argument that people are trying to get at when they mention something like that is the difference between type one and type two muscle fibers, which is the fast and slow twitch. And honestly, although that's something that is obviously you get from your parents and whatnot, epigenetic factors through tra training can actually influence them and can shift them from being more slow to fast twitch. So instead of being like an endurance athlete, you can become more explosive. So instead of like, you know, if you have like marathon runner, genetics that doesn't mean you have to stay a marathon runner. if you train you can eventually become a sprinter because your body will adapt through the training and that'll be encoded into your actual dna which is very cool huh. um what are the long-term effects for men taking injectable testosterone that's a question for Liver King, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not bro, he's daddy, dude. My tribal talents, uh, just liver every day. But um, yeah, honestly, like being someone that actually it, indulged in that dark side for a few months back when I was like, 22, like, yeah, it, it's, it's fun while you're doing it. But literally the, the freakiest thing is just like, what happens to that carry oil? after you're done you know like you're shooting all that stuff intramuscularly but that oil gets absorbed and like the the stuff that's actually dissolving it like the benzo acetate and stuff like where does that go like how is that going to affect your body like not even talking about the testosterone itself but the means of how the testosterone is getting into you like already that's not a good start but you know something shutting down your own production is just going to like cause atrophy in the gonads and then you're, you know, if you're doing that in hopes of like alleviating an issue that spawned because of low testosterone, that's just putting a bandage on it. I think the majority of people, although it's going to be like a pretty arduous task, like I think it's absolutely worth like trying to figure out the root cause of that issue. Like why aren't you producing that adequate amount of testosterone? Yeah, I think is HGH the same way where taking that exogenously decreases your own production. Mm. You know, with a lot of things like melatonin, um, that can increase your own endogenous production, taking a supplement and uh, progesterone, pregnenolone. And I know those are, so it's not like across the board, all um, hormones, but a lot of them like testosterone, right? Well, yeah, so testosterone is definitely like the one that has like the most lower value when it comes down to that, because that will just absolutely decimate your own natural production like if you do want to you know more or less take the easy way out there's also hcg which is like human protein and graph like gonadotropins too many syllables in my word but um basically it's like synthesized from the women uh, from pregnant women's urine and it's something that actually stimulates the balls dropping initially and just having that at like a relatively high dose throughout like Oh, the week for months at a time can be enough to give the gonads the opportunity to just like, you know, get acclimated to producing adequate amounts of testosterone. But like I said, that's again, just another band aid. but I guess it's just going to be, uh, you know, maybe it's got a little cool pattern on it and it's going to be easier to pull off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's definitely a lot of like natural means that someone could try first, right? Like sunlight or red light. On the yeah, red light <laughs> is like the easiest like thing to do because like you know the main thing red light does is it just normalizes cells. So if you have an issue with cells clearly not operating properly, you know, give them a little help. Like before you jump to just stabbing yourself with needles, which is no fun. Like how about you just whip your boys out, and just get blast them with a little bit of light like a few times a week, and you know see how that goes for you. Mm -hmm. um, this is a good one. Uh, how to balance a lot of lifting and tight muscles 
with stretching and flexibility? So this is something that honestly the revelation of just like came suddenly to me and it just made so much sense. But honestly, with correct exercise selection, you should be able to, you know, gain mobility and just range of motion as a whole. Because for instance, like, you know, chest flies and whatnot, like I might not have like the best developed chest, but whenever I do chest flies, I'm making sure I get the biggest stretch possible in my chest. And I've never had issues with tightness in my chest. And that absolutely can be extrapolated to different parts of the body, whether it be your legs or your arms or your back. Like if you're making intelligent selection and what exercises you're actually doing, you can absolutely gain mobility as you're gaining strength without the need for stretching and stretching as a whole. Like I'm honestly not that big on it. If I ever do it, it would be after the gym and it's just kind of for fun, you know, just continuing like a trend of like moving as much as I can throughout the day. And it's just, you know, there, there's better ways to do, to hit like two birds with one stone. It's funny. Someone asked, can cats really build muscle? Cause I, <laughs> I put the picture of you with the cat head. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I guess if they're drinking enough, milk, they can. <laughs> uh, what is a good piece of equipment to start a home gym? Um, probably the most bang for your buck in regards to variety would just be like a squat rack and regular barbell. Um, mm. that's also, yeah, that, that literally opens up like a world of opportunities, especially when you start to think beyond just like the regular like planes of motion. Like you have a barbell, you can turn that into like a landmine and you can start doing so many different movements with that. You can do like a whole bunch of fun, like strongman type of stuff. You can use the barbell just to even like stretch out with. And it's, and it's a great start. But yeah, honestly, just like a full squat rack, a bar, and then obviously you need weights. Otherwise, I would probably say like a power tower. So that would be something with like a dip station and a pull up bar because then you get some very quality body weight movements that you can start up with. And especially if you're new to fitness as a whole, you can really gauge how much of an interest you have in it. That's great. And I think, uh, I think I asked you last, last year, it was like December or something about, uh, resistance bands. You're doing, mm -hmm. a, doing a live and I jumped in and, uh, I think we might've had a question on that, but do you think that could be all, an alternative to two bars? And I think it's, it's absolutely better than nothing, but it depends on what the ultimate goals of that person is. If they're looking to really develop a physique, I think they're going to have to go beyond that because there's only so much you can really do with bands, despite like how creative you can be, the way that that stimulus works and like the progressions with them, like you can only go so far. And if it comes to that, honestly, I would much more, I, I would absolutely be more inclined to recommend like a kettlebell or something to those people. Like I started this kettlebell journey, like within the past half year, and it's just become an obsession because it, it's, it, it's crazy. Like the amount of stuff you can do with it, even something as simple as like a kettlebell swing is so effective in recruiting stuff that otherwise just gets stagnant because of just basic like life as it is now it's too much sitting too much being hunched over like it, it gives you such a great platform to really begin developing like a fit body that will be able to like navigate through life effortlessly and i think that's what most people should really be looking for when it comes to fitness it shouldn't like yeah it's great to look good naked but at the same time i think what's more important is not having to worry about like you know, pain when you're bending down to pick something up or having issues, just grabbing something up high or not being able to carry things. So that, that's, that has such a larger impact on your overall well-being that, you know, it, it, it's a bit sad to see that people forget that that should be, you know, their main goal when it comes to getting fit. Yeah, it's kind of going into it for the wrong reasons, right? If they're feeling like inadequacies and... I don't know. Maybe they're they're bullied or something. They're like, "Yo, I'm gonna get my revenge, get huge," and mm -hmm. um, definitely has to be for the right 
reasons, right? And some people just don't um, want to get muscular, which I think is is interesting. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Like mm-hmm. what stuck with me in some of the Adam Bergstrom interviews I've had with them is <laughs> he has really uh, out there uh, stories that are, are fascinating, but he's, I've asked him about bodybuilding and, you know, he always says there's a difference between um, having muscles and, and strength. And yeah, absolutely. Actually, uh, yeah. strength is a better marker for like all those benefits that come with uh, fitness, like the reduction in all cause mortality than muscle mass. So mm-hmm. at the end of the day, if you're doing this just for your own well being, strength should absolutely be the focus. But muscle mass, of course, when you have more of that, like, half the reason why I want to get bigger is because then that means I can eat more and the more I can eat. That means the more like nutrient dense foods I can shove down my throat and not get fat from. So that's something that, you know, it feeds into itself. And I think like, you know, past the point, like, yeah, maybe you can start to focus on muscle mass and it's going to have like a lot of compounding benefits, but overall strength is definitely the way that people should go. And again, like, that isn't just like, you know, what's your, your bench max or your squat max and all that, but just basic things like grip strength, being able to like sit up and down with no problem, just being able to like my whole thing, it's just like being able to navigate through space effortlessly. Like whenever I'm training, that's what's always in the back of my mind. Like I want to be able to continue to move like this for as long as I can, because I know that if I'm not doing what I can now, I'm absolutely going to suffer later. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, let's see, fat loss for women. Or are you gonna say fat loss in general? <laughs> so that's something that you know it's really funny to see because, especially with women, just because of the way that their hormones fluctuate throughout the month, there are like little intricacies. Like, yeah, you could be calorically restricting, you could be expending more calories than you're putting in, but you know, maybe your estrogen is high, maybe your cortisol is high. There's other factors that are playing roles that could be stopping you from safely liberating fat. And honestly, I think the most important thing when it comes to trying to effectively lose fat is reducing stress, trying to mute cortisol as effectively as you can, and just like trying to keep inflammation as a whole like down. Like one of my favorite things when I was like more aggressively cutting was I would take aspirin every day. And that's just obviously apart from like the, the, the thyroid type of benefit, like that was putting my body in a state where it could focus solely on recovery, where it could be close to homeostasis. So, you know, that fat was being used as energy when I'm just, you know, lounging around and everything. So yeah, definitely the worst thing you could do is obviously just, you know, keep blasting cardio, upping it, upping it, upping it, upping it, and eating less and less when in reality, I think this, the best thing to do would maybe like up calories a little bit, make sure you're getting all those nutrient dense foods that are preached about on the show every episode and just ensure that, you know, you're not stressing out because, you know, if you're, going to the gym, you feel anxious, you feel stressed, you don't want to be there. Like, how do you think something good is going to come from that? You're going to put your body in like a genuinely dormant state and that's not conducive to like any goal. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's a good point too about cortisol, whether it's, you know, based on the cycle or just they're working a crappy job or, you know, living in a stressful environment or Mm -hmm. stressful relationship, like, people could be stuck in a certain state physiologically of having like maybe excess weight just because of stuff going on in their life outside of like, yeah, there's so many environmental factors that can like, you know, really bog down your body in that regard. Like your fat is there to let your body feel safe. Like it is that thing that tells your brain, like, yeah, if, shit hit the fan we can survive like however long after this and if you're constantly in that state where your body feels like shit's about to hit the fan but you're still eating why do you think that you're going to be liberating fat like you're obviously going to be trying to hold on to it then naturally cortisol goes up what does cortisol do breaks down muscle tissue so it's like it's a double negative like you're, you're fucking yourself up on both fronts and it's just awful 
made an explicit note. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, let's see. How does he prepare his raw ground beef uh, or meat to eliminate chances of parasites? I just kind of <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've been doing it for, you know, I was around for like strictly like almost three years, and not once did I ever feel something like bumbling around in my stomach. Nothing ever came out of me. That's not saying that like I don't have anything, but you know, I've never had any digestive upset from consuming copious pounds of raw flesh. Alien never like burst out of your stomach. Or... Nah, <laughs> Started singing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what else we got here. Uh... Hmm. What most improves the metabolism? It's like a really broad question. Yeah. Wow. Um... <laughs> Honestly, like, this is something that I realized recently, what, looking back on my own history and whatnot, but it's going to be a very long-winded answer. But, um, you know, having those days of being, like, a fit so person and seeing, like, all the other health, quote-unquote, or rather fit influencers, like, it, it's so funny how big of a disconnect there is between, like, the fit people and, like, the explicitly health people, but... I've noticed that like the fit people usually turn more into health people than the health people turn into fit people. But just having that base foundation of fitness, just because you're moving more throughout the week, you're exerting yourself and, you know, hopefully optimally recovering from it. That's going to be like the best thing you can do to increase your metabolism because yeah, you can take as much thyroid and other supplements as you want, but at the end of the day, like, you know, if you're just moving more and your body's okay with you doing that, then, you know, you're going to increase your, the amount of calories you can have and your metabolism is going to you know, reflect that. Mm -hmm. um, what are the best workouts during pregnancy? Is that a good idea? <laughs> it depends. I've seen a lot of questionable stuff with pregnant women doing CrossFit. And that just looks like it's going to give the baby like a concussion. But honestly, just making sure you're not stagnant, just making sure you move. And honestly, like doing anything is better than nothing. But of course, doing too much can be even worse. So you just want to find like a middle ground where you feel okay with what you're doing. Obviously, having that enjoyment factor, especially when you're pregnant, because you don't want to be creating like a high serotonin state for your baby to develop in. Like if you're able to find activities that you genuinely enjoy, whether it be like just walking around, hiking, dancing, just stuff that really pulls you and compels you to do it. I think those are like the excellent choices you can make. And yeah, you could train if you're like, if you're somebody that just enjoys the gym, go for it. But just remember that you're not trying to push limits. You're, you're the way you are with that little one inside of you and you should definitely take that in consideration with you know exercise selection and how much you're willing to really put out in the gym yeah that's that's great i wonder how much like I, I think there's so much that we're still discovering about um how how like a developing fetus is affected by what mom's doing mm -hmm. like i was just hearing about uh melatonin how the if the circadian rhythm of the mother is dysregulated, like maybe she's working nights or just isn't, you know, isn't getting bright light in the morning in the daytime, it's getting blasted with artificial light at night, that mm -hmm. can actually like have a like semi-permanent effect on the circadian rhythm uh, uh, of, the, of the child that's developing. So yeah, I need to have a whole show on melatonin. I think it's fascinating, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, you know, it makes complete sense because that, that is like, you know, those are the formative months and definitely what happens then is going to be just how you go about most of the rest of your life. Um, best hydration drink post-workout? 
I, I don't know. With that, I'm kind of weird because I really don't like drinking water or anything mm-hmm. as I'm training. And afterwards, I'll just have like a little protein shake with water. And it's, you know, it's an opportunity to get some copper. But um, if that's something that you're really feeling like afterwards, you feel drained, you can definitely tell that your electrolytes are imbalanced. Definitely like coconut water with like a sprinkle of salt or like, you know, maybe a scoop of the adrenal cocktail in there if you can handle it. And yeah, it's. It doesn't need to be rocket science. Like plain and simple, you're sweating, you're losing electrolytes, try and replenish them as effectively as you can and do it in a way that agrees with your stomach because there's definitely some things I don't want to do like right after a workout, like you know, having something super heavy to drink and you know, your stomach just finished not having anything in it, then you're giving it something that's like pretty intensive for it to digest and you know, just common sense. Yeah. I used to hit the hemp hemp protein powder pretty hard and that uh that took me <laughs> months to discover that didn't do well on my body it just mm-hmm. felt felt bloated and like it was just sitting there yeah there has been oh my god i remember i think like uh bob redmills or whatever that brand is they have like a pea protein powder with like chia seeds mixed in it and i got that once and just like oh yeah cool like, i'm gonna have like another 15 grams of protein into my protein shake i'm like Whew, never again but um yeah even with like all those protein powders like i finally found one that i'm kind of okay with it's an 80 20 blend of casein and whey respectively and i think that's really good because you know obviously casein is like nicer on the body with like tryptophan and everything but whey does have a purpose like for example, one of the things that it does is actually help regulate glucosamine production. So as an antioxidant, having that post-workout can definitely help balance out like the inflammation that you just like purpose- purposefully incurred on yourself. And, you know, ultimately I would prefer to just have a whole food meal, but it, it's convenient. So, you know, I'm willing to take whatever consequences may come with it. Yeah. It- I need to get back into the smoothies. It's just tricky being here in North Idaho because the, the fruit selection, you know, have to go frozen, which mm. is not necessarily ideal, but <laughs> yeah. so um, better than nothing. Right. Uh, we had a question. Are you familiar with the work of Dr. Michael? Yes. Is. If so, how do you feel about one times 20 programs? I am not. <laughs> okay. If, yeah, I've never heard of them. <laughs> yeah, one by twenty. I'm assuming like one set of twenty reps, and probably yeah. I, I mean, if there's like a warm up to it, and you're using like a weight that actually like has you like coming close to like muscle failure by that twentieth rep, then maybe that would be good. Like it seems a bit excessive, and honestly, I think there's a bunch of different ways that you're better off going about training than something like that yeah this is a question for me what if someone just did pull-ups and push-ups would that be an and 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 they're walking after meals would that be enough that would be great like add some sort of like squat or like mixing kettlebell swings with that holy cow you're, you're set that's that's great like you have, you, you have your push you have your pull and you have your hip hinge and like that's gonna get your back completely toasted that's gonna get your chest going and your arms and yeah that's if you want to go like as minimalist as possible great if you want to like take that to the next level i think honestly if you do like really heavy really heavy ish kettlebell swings and just pair that with like dips or something you're set like it really doesn't need to be rocket science and if you're really just trying to get like the benefits of strength you can go pretty minimal and still get a lot of the benefits that's awesome i think that's let's see um advice for an endurance athlete um how can i balance pushing the limits for physical stress i don't know exactly what that means so you know (laughs) endurance athletes are definitely I think consistently there might be just a few screws with them because pushing yourself consistently to such an extreme limit is definitely going to be something that's hard for your body to recover from. But I think if you're able to 
you know, have that one extreme limit be kind of like an isolated event. So for example, if you're a runner, if you're training up to that race without, you know, doing like a marathon every fucking week leading up to it. And instead just like training yourself in different like heart rate ranges and having like, you know, having a more, having a longer day, having a shorter, more intense day, and just like varying your training so that you're not constantly pushing yourself to the edge. I think that's a really good way to be able to achieve like some serious feats of endurance without having like the negative effects associated with that. Because obviously, you know, if, if you're doing like really hardcore endurance stuff, your cortisol is going to be through the roof, even just running and whatnot, that actually can increase endotoxin in the gut just because of the, all the stuff moving around in there. And that's what, the reason why some like marathon runners kind of just like spontaneously let loose because their bodies are literally just voiding themselves of all that endotoxin. And yeah, like definitely don't push yourself consistently hard. Really focus on programming your training leading up to whatever event so that you're getting a good enough uh, stimulus and response from what you're doing, but you're not pushing yourself like constantly past barriers because you can absolutely increase your fitness within more moderate ranges. You don't need to go consistently crazy and push yourself to the limit if you want to be a higher elite athlete. Have you ever, um, have you been friends with any like swimmers or like where that's their main form of movement? Back in high school, yeah. Hmm. But the sw swimmers are their little otters, man. Like the, the physiques they get are insane. And like, I, if, funny enough, I think a good portion of that is just because of the water, because the water is dispersing the heat. So like they're increasing their overall like metabolic activity by two ways, obviously the actual activity and the fact that their body needs to like keep up the heat. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they, they swimmers, like God bless them, dude. Like I... I Alba and I went to a friend's house on a lake and, you know, they have buoys around the lake and I hit like one of the buoys, like, I think it was like a 20 minute swim and like a third of the way into it, I was like, why did I do this? Like, this is, I, I, I feel like I'm sweating under the water and like I'm burning, like my muscles are just on fire, but like, yes, swimming, swimming's wild. Yeah, I... I've always struggled with it. Like I took a YMCA class growing up and I, I think that I just almost drowned. And it, I mean, I've always, <laughs> I've always like just sank because my body fat was so low. <laughs> and uh, so when I got scuba certified for, for open water, like um, like the first, you know, scuba diving certification, mm -hmm. uh, you have to, you have to float or tread water for 10 minutes yeah. in a public swimming pool and I couldn't do it. And so I had to redo it and the instructor let me just float on my back, which I pretty much had to just keep, you know, full belly of air or full mm -hmm. lungs of air to keep myself buoyant. But yeah, swimming is one of those things, I guess it's just getting down the, the foot little circles, right. To kind of stay, stay yeah, hovering yeah. there. But I never did it. I mean, I probably should having a lake. So. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I prefer just like diving under, like scuba diving rather than yeah, so under. Much fun, dude. Yeah. Have you done it? Or? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. I got yeah. certified in like, but my parents like certified me in like sixth grade. Like they took me out to Mexico and we did it. it was, that was a hell of an experience. But yeah, I've gone a few times and it's, it's surreal. I bet the visibility was pretty good down there. Oh, like, dude, it was gorgeous. Mm, most of my dives, like it was in murky, like probably 20 foot visibility average, mm. like the whatever, 50, 60, 70 dives I did. But it's kind of fun because it's like an element of surprise because you can't see that far. <laughs> and mm. So you kind of have to be more alert. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I want to ask you, uh, I think that's it for the questions, but um, question that came up for me, like hot, cold therapy, like your thoughts on that. Cause I know a lot of athletes use that as like a recovery thing and so, it's like trendy. No. I'm really big on sauna. I, I love my sauna. I, I've got a far infrared one. I 
used to spend like at least 30 minutes in it after every day that I trained. But after a point, I was just like, I don't want my body to get so dependent on like needing this for recovery. And recently, like honestly, just like a hot, cold shower, like that's really enough to just help the mu- help the muscles, you know, the blood vessels expand, it flushes out like metabolic waste and all those byproducts that you aren't too keen on keeping. And then when you close it, everything constricts and it just whoosh. And I, I really think for the average gym goer, just like, you know, nuking whatever body part with some hot water and then just like going cold for a little bit, nothing crazy, obviously, like it's just a shower, like you're not doing an ice bath or anything, but that's really just like a great way to get some bang out of get some bang for your buck out of the shower as long as you hopefully have the shower filter. So you never got into like the ice baths or the cold tub? <laughs> Very briefly. I, I I don't remember how old I was, but there was a time where I took a break from working out. And when I got back into it, I was getting crazy sore every day. So I was doing like really cold baths. But I did that maybe for like two weeks max. And uh, I was like, okay, I'm fine. I can work out without feeling like I'm stiff as I'm over after. Do you ever feel like a brain buzz from that? Because when I was doing it, it would make me super high, like for the whole day. Like once recently, mm-hmm. I did sauna into like a genuine like ice bath, like just because like I think the grocery store would want to have enough ice on sale, which still I, mean, I ice was on sale. Now. But uh I grabbed some, I threw it in the tub, and like after the sauna, I chilled in there. I was like, wow, like I I can kind of get why people do this. But at the same time, I I'm guessing it was from like stress hormones and whatnot. So it's definitely not something that you want to consistently do. But yeah, as a treat, why not? Um see I'm trying to think of what what we didn't potentially uh cover. As we did, we didn't talk too much about carbohydrates, like, because you always hear of like carb refeeding. Mm-hmm. That's mostly for like keto people, I guess. But yeah. carbs are a huge uh, part of of uh, working out and bodybuilding because it's like the muscle glycogen, right? That you need mm-hmm. to refill. Yeah, and of course, carbs are also protein sparing. So if you mm-hmm. really want to get like the most bang for your buck from your diet, just in including carbs like post-workout that's going to be a great way to have the carbs do some of the roles that protein can also do so protein can actually just focus on doing the things that you know it can that so protein can just do protein's job yeah Mm. yeah that's an important message that carbs are protein sparing because it seems like people forget that the keto people don't want people to know that right yeah (laughs) and and Yeah, like I I remember like, you know, middle school health class, that being just like one of the things that people would mention in regards to carbs. Like it's more than like a fuel source, like clearly if it's going to be able to jump in the place of protein, like obviously I'm sure that's what's happening in the cases of like some fruitarians and some like more plant-based people. But, you know, it. why wouldn't you want to take advantage of that? Mm -hmm. Doing it. Like, is it um, dose dependent? Like Ray, Ray's probably talked about that, but like increasing your carbs increases the protein sparing. I'm like, not actually too but, familiar with that, but I know that on average, you would want to have like five to 10 grams of carbs per kilo of body weight. Mm. And I think Perry workout, I actually have a note of that. Uh, post-exercise, uh, one gram of carb per kilo of uh body weight every hour for four hours after like a really intense training session. So, you know, you have that with your protein shake or whatever protein source you have post-workout. You're using the insulin boosting effect of the protein to ensure that the carbs are getting shuttled across the body along with all the nutrients that dies down. And then afterwards, you know, that four hour window, you have that again, and then it just facilitates a very positive state for growth. Mm. did you ever utilize like the like ground beef bowls with like rice because that <laughs> that's what carried me through for years like when i was lazy or just you know busy just throw together like you know ground bison or ground beef with 
you know, white rice or, or actual wild rice and like butter and salt. Mm. I just find like a lot of people are just really confused and overwhelmed of what to eat. And so that's why they tend to just go for like, you know, the carnivore diet or something just cause it's like stupid, simple, but mm. it, it can still be simple and you, you don't have to miss out on like macronutrients. Right. Yeah, there's this one guy, Stan Afrodick, who's his nickname is the Rhino. He's an absolute tank. If I'm not mistaken, he's the one who came up with the term. It, it, he calls that combo monster mash. And that's absolutely like what it could be. Like that's such a potent, like nutrient-dense, energy-filled meal that you could have after exercise. And that's gonna like get you, you know, refueled. It's gonna be what turns into muscle, like plain and simple. What's his name? Stan Efferding. Hmm. I haven't heard of him. Monster Mash. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, was, was there anything we didn't talk about that you wanted to cover? Um, let's see. I have a few notes. Uh, so many directions we can go. But <laughs> honestly, I'm going to try to spare you from just like shedding on like Fitzgram as a whole, because that is just <laughs> such a toxic high of villainy. We do not go there anymore. And yeah, honestly, more or less, I just want to say like the minimum effective dose for most people when it comes to training is going to be enough to cause a very positive benefit in their life. The main benefits from training itself actually come from going as a not fit person to just being averagely fit you don't need to be some like elite level elite level lifter or endurance athlete or anything you just need to be able to move effectively and have your body do what it's meant to do and you know you're going to have like all those benefits in regards to like you know insulin sensitivity you're going to be able to eat more you're going to be like able to keep moving throughout your entire life without issues and yeah it's just people really think it's rocket surgery when at the end of the day, it's not like our bodies have been crafted by our environment for so long. And now that we have the opportunity to like specifically craft them, it still is the same thing at the end of the day. And people try and overcomplicate that. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. And that's it. That gets people in a state of paralysis, right? When there's, it, it's too complicated <laughs> or they're just hearing mm -hmm. everyone saying different things. They're like, okay, I'm just going to do nothing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, you know, obviously who you compare yourself to, like if, like I mentioned earlier, if you're comparing yourself to like a bodybuilder, or like one of those crazy athletes doing like all these feats of strength, like how's that going to impact you mentally, let alone like how is that going to impact like how you decide to go about your training? Like not everybody needs to do that and that's not knocking on the people that love doing that like all the more power to them but if you're just trying to be fit if you're trying to not have issues with mobility later in life there really isn't much that you have to do to get those benefits yeah i saw a guy uh doing a, a bench press underwater <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> i'm sure he was natty too right <laughs> Like, wouldn't it be easier because it's, like, less weight underwater? <laughs> I don't know. Water would be weighing down too. Oh, yeah. yeah. I remember Muhammad Ali used to train that underwater, which is pretty fucking crazy. But, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't think that chain underwater is going to be the, uh, the hottest here in training that time soon. Get fitted up in all my, my scuba gear with my regulator and go down <laughs> to the bottom of my lake and lift. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I like the the simplicity and um, yeah, just like easy uh, starting points for people, like just walking after they eat. And um, what do you say people don't like, because I've heard years ago, I think I heard an idea of like moving every hour, like say if you work at home like me and you don't have to like drive to work and you just, you have a lot of flexibility there than just every hour doing pull-ups or every hour doing push-ups and kind of spreading it out throughout the entire day. But I imagine that has a different effect, right? Than like putting it all in one hour. Or... It does, but actually that's a great way to develop strength because that's um, that practice is commonly referred to as loosening the groove. And that's basically just like 
priming your brain and your muscles to doing the same thing again and again and eventually you just get more effective at doing it and like back when i was a fatty like that's how i started to do like chin-ups and whatnot like i would just have a pull-up bar at my door and every time i'd start with like one and then slowly i built up to two three and then i was cranking out ten like it was nothing and, you know it, it what you put in you get out and even if it is over the span of a day you know, you're still going to get that strength. You just might not get as much of like an actual stimulus in regards to like muscle development. And and why is that? Is it just like that's more if it's really intense for exactly an hour? The intensity isn't there. okay. So you have like the overall volume, but the, the intensity because it's spread out, you're losing on like one of the factors that is like part of developing muscle. Mm. Is that what's called muscle protein synthesis, right? Or, uh, or that is more so just how protein is used in the body to develop muscle as like a tissue. Mm. Yeah, you could tell. You could tell I'm uh, I'm ignorant <laughs> about this. <laughs> well, but I my, hope I could have been like <laughs> Yeah, I'm learning a lot. I, I mean, my goal, I'm, I'm kind of succeeding here, is just creating more responsibilities with running a little homestead by myself currently and just adding on more things that are, you know, kind of prepping or whatever, but it's like for a purpose, right? It's like mm -hmm. setting up a little garden where I'm going to have to maintain maybe a little koi pond in there and, you know, vegetables and fruit and there's pruning, there's watering, there's, you know, maybe weeding and checking stuff. And so just like, that's my goal ultimately, ultimately is just integrating all these movement things throughout my day where it's like, where I'm actually getting something out of it. Mm. Like that. I know you're getting something out of it when you're exercising, but just something that, you know, tangible, you can eat, you know, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, absolutely. eggs or something. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure even just like lugging hay around, like that's something that you have to do almost every day i'm sure and that's something that like over time that's going to just get easier and easier because your body's making the, the necessary adaptations to it because clearly it's something that you know you're not getting around you can't cheat it so your body's going to be like okay so it's either like adapt or just continue having a struggle with it mm -hmm. have you ever uh chainsawed or chopped wood oh absolutely like that. <laughs> we had we had like you remember those os trees like those trees that were like genetically modified so they would grow super quick they used to have infomercials for them all the time huh. my dad was obsessed with them and we had like at least 20 of them growing on our like quarter acre property at one point and then i'm like dad the roots are going to grow into the foundation of the house you know that right and then like i literally watched the color just fall out of my dad's face and we cut them all down and him being him didn't want to waste the wood. So I had to, you know, process a whole lot of lumber. So I'm definitely about the wood chopping life. Wow. Yeah, I guess I, I'm learning all the lingo. I didn't know there were all these words that go along with it. Like um, just cleared here off my deck, like a pretty large area. I don't know what it is, football field or something. And I guess the the raw trees that are fell you put them in uh, what's called decking and then you have to buck them up, which is basically chopping the, you know, <laughs> into um, rounds. And then, you, and then you, you have to split those rounds either by hand or with mm. wood splitter hydraulic machine. And uh, yeah, it's, I don't think people realize how, how much goes into it. And oh, I, yeah. I often do the thought experiment. Like if I couldn't get gas or diesel, like, I mean, to do this all by hand without a chainsaw, um, that'd be be like a week long process just to get a little yeah, bit. Right, exactly, like that's absolutely something that people take for granted, especially with like you know you just buy wood and it's already pre cut and everything. Like people aren't thinking about like you know how it got to that state, let alone when you're you know in a homesteading situation and you're the one responsible for turning it into that. Mm -hmm. Did you did you grow up in the snow where it snowed or? No, nah. I mean, yeah, it's no, but like nothing crazy. Like I'm from Jersey, mm. I've always been here, and mm. yeah, we've had some like crazy snowstorms in the past, but nothing like you know, with no Idaho, Idaho experience, I'm sure. Yeah, because I feel like for like five or six months, like if if someone lives in the 
snow, especially at my latitude, like, like, yeah, you can use a tractor and a snowblower and you have different tools, hopefully, but there's going to be a point where you need that shovel to like Mm -hmm. clear, like, like the steps or keep areas clear. And, uh, man, that, that worked me every winter that I've been here. I mean, the last two winters, it it feels like a full body workout, just keeping up on the snow. (laughs) I don't know what kind of movement that is, but (laughs) definitely full body. It's like, you know, we we haven't gotten crazy snow, but I have like a comically long driveway. So I've definitely been out there before the sun's up trying to clear it for my mom to get to work. And like, yeah, it, it leaks absolutely gas. But the fact that, you know, the weather does not care and you're going to have to do that multiple times a season. Like that's, that, that, that's how you get that farm strength for sure. Do you do any yard work where you live? Like do you have to do any weed whacking or mowing or. So right now we're living in an apartment, but my parents, you know, because of my dad's situation and my mom's my mom, I visit every now and then. I just like take care of like all the, uh, the landscaping and whatnot. So I still get to enjoy the smell of fresh cut grass on a summer's morning and uh, all the lovely poison ivy that just hides in our backyard. But um, <laughs> yeah, I'm still getting that. And honestly, like that, that's just, I, I take such pride in like maintaining my land. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like as an American, that's something that people should really enjoy doing and not like outsourcing but um yeah it's just it's little things like that really like if you just focus on doing like taking care of yourself and and your land like you will have like a probably a above average level of fitness Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i recently uh started using the weed whacker more and just i mean it's a really heavy it's a gas powered machine and that vibrates mm-hmm. and just keeping it steady. And it's amazing after I just a, a tank of gas in that thing, how much that'll work out my arms. It's, mm-hmm. it's unbelievable. Oh yeah. And definitely like those static movements like that, like, you know, just holding, trying to hold it steady, trying to like, you know, bring hay over and you've got it in like a grip with your arms locked and everything. Like that's, people don't take isometrics with the, respect they deserve because that's such an easy way to like really develop strength and it's something that like you know it, it's by no means glamorous but it's absolutely effective mm-hmm. i sometimes i have a thought like if i just went into my uh my buck enclosure like once a week that's probably all i need to do as far as working out <laughs> because I, I had a funny experience where i was uh i hired a guy to help me clear out his his uh, straw in his enclosure because it gets really gross in there, uh-huh. especially with the mail. And, uh, you know, I'm like, I could go in there with my electric prodder or, or a, you know, a blower and try to keep him away from you. He's like, no, no, I got it. And I'm sitting there on the other side of the fence watching and he ends up getting my buck in a headlock and they both drop to the ground and I'm there like laughing hysterically. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. And he's just fully winded after like the buck totally, I mean, I don't know how much he weighs right now, but it has to be, I don't know, at least 300 pounds, probably a little more. And he was just, he was spent. He was dripping sweat. And he's like, I didn't know he was that strong. Matt, if you ever need someone to wrestle with, go give me a call. (laughs) I'm just grateful they don't have like sharp teeth. You know, they don't bite. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) A nightmare yeah, yeah. Uh, that's funny um yeah what are the questions so you said you don't really drink water because i tend to mostly drink water when i wake up that's like when my body seems to crave it the most and you know so, maybe before bed so i was like strictly the well i, I curse a lot but I, I was the ceo of gang fuck water for a very <laughs> long time but recently, with just, you know, uh, I, I'm out in the sun, I'm exercising, I'm sweating like an absolute pig. And honestly, like, I come home and I use the uh, the, the glowing IC pad and I imprint my water. And, you know, it's kind of a like a win-win because one, I'm hydrating and two, I'm getting whatever, like, 
fancy stuff and imprinting, which is usually just like BPC 157 and TV 500 just to help my joints and whatnot. And for as woo of a technology as infoceuticals uh, are, like I definitely notice a benefit. Like my shoulder gives me like periodically issues, but when I'm really consistent with that water and the fact that I'm, like, I'm having it on more or less an empty stomach, like first or second thing in the morning, like I, I really notice just like less pain, better range of motion and all that. Mm. So I, I think honestly, the only thing that's got me drinking water is, you know, the glowing I see now, which is kind of fun. That's awesome. Yeah. And for, for people that aren't familiar, like at a show, um, I can't remember his name. Anton, uh, Anton Renko. Yeah, that's it. Yep. Yeah, it's just this little blue thing, right? That it's USB charged and then it's connected to the website. And then you can run, uh, as John said, infoceuticals in it, which is essentially like the energetic signature of whatever substance you want, whether it's aspirin or, you know, hormones, progesterone, you can put in your water or peptides or whatever. Yeah, it's like cyberpunk homeopathy. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> right. That's awesome. Um, let's see if there's anything else that I wanted to... Seems like you have you had a lot of notes there. <laughs> yeah, yeah like, I'm prepared. <laughs> Was there any other topics you wanted to hit? Or... I mean, honestly, I think I actually managed to sneak like every one of my little notes into the responses I gave. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm pretty satisfied. So, are you are you planning on working with clients, or do you currently, or? Uh, yeah, actually, I am in the finishing stages of setting up JohnTheSavage.com, where I'll be offering services like nutritional coaching. Because at the end of the day, I am a uh, uh, NTP, so you know, nutrition was the first fancy letter by my name that I got. Funny enough, not exercise, but you know, I'm definitely with ten years of like personal experience. I'm very well worked, very well versed with that stuff. But um, yeah, I'm going to offer nutritional coaching and I'm going to make customized training regimens and training blocks and just like a combination service of both of those and also consultations. So yeah, if you're interesting, interested, you like the cut of my jib, check out jumbosavage.com and yeah, maybe I can really improve the quality of your life by letting you gain the freedom your body deserves. That's awesome. I love it. Well, yeah, I highly recommend you guys check out um, his website. When when is that going to launch? You think? Uh, definitely by the time this comes out. Oh, great! Yeah, like we're awesome. just finishing like the last little tweaks on the website itself, and you know, it should be good to go in no time. Awesome! Right on. Well, uh, yeah, thanks, man. This was really fun, and uh, I, I learned some good stuff, and I'm inspired to. Even though I'm moving constantly and uh, I, have, I have the perfect space to go out and ground and do uh, more nature walks. So it's uh, just always a balancing act, right? With work and trying to research and produce content and Absolutely. juggle all these areas of life. <laughs> yeah, that's, that is for sure. <laughs> right on. We'll uh, stick around as we close out the show. Thanks, John. Right. Awesome. Thanks, man. That is a wrap for today's show. John really inspired me to move more consistently. I have a fully off-grid homestead, and right now it's summer, and even though I don't have to clear snow, there's still a lot to do, tending to my goats, my chickens. I have to clear my solar panels every once in a while with the hose to get all the dust and dirt off of them. And just general maintenance on the property, which I really enjoy doing. It forces me outside to get sunlight on my skin and my eyes, getting fresh air. I mean, to me, all this stuff we shouldn't have to think about, but because of modern living and working in an office at a computer indoors, we actually do have to make an effort now to get sun in our naked eyes and to move our bodies 
And I've just integrated since speaking with John walks after every meal, just a short 10 minute walk. And that's made a world of difference in how I feel my digestion, my energy, my mood. I'm really blown away by just a 10 minute walk after breakfast and after lunch, even just twice a day has such a powerful effect. My friend Tyler Pansner actually just shared a study that a 10 minute walk after eating is twice as effective as a prescription anti-diabetes drug metformin. So it actually helps glucose get into the cells without the help of insulin, which is incredible. And that's just a simple 10 minute walk. So that blew my mind, just the importance of timing your walk like that to get that huge effect. John also inspired me to purchase a kettlebell. I had one years ago and I wasn't consistent with it. I just did the basic kettlebell swing, but I feel really good using that just two to three times a day. So I love that these things don't take a ton of time. It's just spacing them throughout the day and you don't have to spend hours and hours in the gym. I think if you're looking for a very basic place to start, those post-meal walks and just a simple kettlebell, I'm doing a 30-pound one to start out, is great. And I'm already feeling the benefits just doing that for four or five days. So if you want to book a consultation with John, you can go to johnthesavage.com. I'll put the link below to that. He's on Instagram. He has great free information on there, different exercises that you can do. And if you want to work with him with nutritional coaching or personal training or both, then you could check out his website. And my website is matt-blackburn.com. You can check out my CLF protocol under blogs. And then under shop, you can see all of my recommended products that I use. I've been so busy upgrading MitoLife my brand that I haven't had much time to experiment with new products, but I am still loving that Somni Resonance SR1, also called Delta Sleeper, on my website. I started using my Generation 2 Aura Ring again because the third generation, the only one you could buy now, has that melatonin suppressing green light coming out of it that's very bright in the middle of the night. So I found my old one that doesn't have any green and I've been tracking my sleep again with it on airplane mode. And whenever I use that Somni Resonance, that little PEMF device that goes under the clavicle, I'm just blown away how good I sleep. And if I wake up too early or wake up at the middle of the night, it's just a simple press of the button and it always knocks me out. And it's not going to work for everybody. Sleep is one of those individual things that I'm really fascinated with. You have to experiment with different things. I think the combination that John shared of the nasal dilator with the mouth taping at the same time is a really great place to start. And if that doesn't do it or you want to get crazier, then you can combine it with something like this, the SR1, and do the nasal dilator, the mouth tape, and just see how good you feel the next day. To me, the sleep stuff's the most fun because it's the easiest to quantify. You know how you feel when you wake up in the morning. And I'm about to get back to mouth taping actually tonight. And I fully shaved my beard because the mouth tape does not work with beards. And to me, the mouth taping always worked better than the nasal dilators. But experiment, do both. Do one or the other and find out what works for you. So my company, as I mentioned, is MitoLife, and I'm working hard to basically revamp all of the products. By the end of the summer, everything will have been upgraded. So I'm really excited about that. People have been begging for smaller vitamin E capsules, so we're going to switch over to those and come out with a freeze-dried beef liver product and some other exciting products that are coming up really soon. 
Check out the Mito Life Academy. That's my private YouTube where I put up two videos a month. It's fifteen dollars a month. You get two videos and a live Q and A the last day of every month where you could ask me anything and hear my up to date research. I tend to listen to these educators, but then I put the dots together myself and have discussions amongst my friends, my girlfriend, and just bounce ideas off of each other. And I think that's how we learn best. It's not just by following the leader. And I encourage everyone listening to me to do the same and experiment and find what works best for your body. So thanks for listening. I'll see you guys next Friday and stay supercharged.